So my first question actually is to you, Anna. Um, so there was a recent statement by a government official, and it kind of went unnoticed, I think it was a few weeks ago, where they said we are now manipulating space-time. We have the ability to manipulate space-time. So let that seem in for a moment. That was an official statement by a U.S. government representative, and we can collaborate on that. Well, there's certainly been uh, publicly visible funding that has gone into that. And um, I'll say a couple of things before I would say there's a, a much better expert in the audience, uh, Dr. Julia Mossbridge, in terms of um, space-time work. Um, also, that's something that Dr. Hal Kutoff with space-time metric engineering has been very active in. Um, so, so there's been plenty of work on that, and um, there, there's a lot that's going on. So on the backdrop of that, the National Science Foundation has been a fund of... Oh, sorry, just one quick thing oh. to say. But by the way, um, we we also, a few of us were also, maybe several of us in the room about over a year ago, were on uh, the National Mall at the National Academy of Sciences, where it was National Space Week. And there were some uh, presenters from around the world, and that also included a representative uh, from the, the Chinese government, or the, presumably the CCK. And the presentation that they were putting up included requests for, we want to work with people on, I believe it was space-time metric engineering. Uh, it was gravitational control, and it was also alien life off planet, um, amongst other things like renewables. So the Chinese are literally coming down to the National Mall and saying, hi, come talk to us about this. You know, and so, come on. Seriously. Another thing that they said, by the way, you know, in terms of many of us have been advocating for much higher levels of capital to go into innovation and also into in space infrastructure, which does not have access to the terrestrial financial tools like debt. You know, so if you buy a house, most people, they're making a smaller down payment, 20 percent, 5 percent, whatever they could do, more of a minimum. In space, it's typically you've got to front all of the money up front. Can you, it, it, you're not going to build a hospital for the individual patient. You need to have the financial model. So anyways, when I was trying to figure out what was the space budget for China, they wouldn't tell me. But um, the, the gentleman did look at me in disdain. You know, he's talking to all of you. He said, when we look at putting up a space station, we view that, does that cost the same amount of money as putting down a couple kilometers of Metro, basically, we're gonna do that all day, every day. So if we can't figure out how to make the investments to win in these transformational markets for abundance, for societal benefits, and for economic growth and gain, uh, we're gonna be left behind. So this is a, so the people that are moving forward are moving forward. We really hope that the, U, the US government, the Fortune One, um, you know, is able to share some of the great work that's been done you know, previously across all these fields, but the private sector is moving forward. Folks, we're going to have time for only two very quick questions. We're already way over our time, and we have to unfortunately surrender this room back over to folks. So let me finish. I've got two years and afterwards, if you want to get with our guests, you can. Um, we're not going to have time to open up right now for, for public questions. So I have, uh, let me get to this real quick. And if we could, our guests, please keep um, the answer as succinct as possible. Uh, before we actually get tougher, bro. Um, let me start with, with you, Anna. Um, the National Science Foundation has been a fundamental pillar of some of America's revolutionary technology and concepts for many decades. How can the NSF help the government now concerning the topic of UAPs? Well, I guess one of the things that's just publicly visible is that we have been, uh, when I was formerly at NSF, uh, I would just say that there's lots of publicly visible content of us being very uh, forward on the topic, listening to innovators, working with strong colleagues from across the interagency. So I, I think that uh, NSF has shown and NSF leadership has also just been extremely supportive. So I just want to be very clear. I left the government because I'm excited about building things in the private sector, and I only ever received the greatest support and collaboration from my interagency colleagues and from the agencies with which I worked, who are extremely forward on all areas of innovation, but certainly UAP fits within that, including 
are publicly visible awards that were made to uh, fund UAP science. There's plenty of pe there's great people that are highly supportive, you know, particularly over there. That's very encouraging. Thank you. Mike, um, last question. You were on the NASA UAP independent study team. My question for you is, what were the recommendations of the NASA UAP independent study team and how those recommendations, how should those recommendations be implemented? Uh, for the purpose of time to thank you for that question, I'll focus on two uh, of those recommendations. We already discussed going through the NASA archives with an AI ML system to get the data, just the few examples of which we were able to show today, again, which could be quite extraordinary. Candidly, I think there are companies that would even volunteer to do that work for NASA. But the second one, and I really appreciate you showing that photo, which was taken by a commercial pilot. And one of the great disappointments I had when I was on the UAP independent study team was I was asking the FAA, how many reports have you gotten from commercial pilots? Are those reports being archived? How are we keeping track of that? And I got confusion. Confusion and no straight answers. And here I like the credits of Brian Graves yet again uh, for suggesting that we leverage NASA's Aviation Safety Reporting System, ASRS, which has been operating for decades, has hundreds of thousands of cases. And this is a confidential system where pilots, crew can call in about safety anomalies that they've experienced. It's worked phenomenally well. We should be leveraging this system for the reporting of UAP. It could be done quickly, it could be done efficiently, and the amount of data that we will receive wouldn't be amazing. Additionally, the images that I showed you was from Blue Ghost, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. Public-private partnerships have driven all of this. I'm so excited for the democratization of space and the data that we will get from that. This was just one example today. As SpaceX, Blue Origin, Red Alert, other companies move forward, all with their own cameras, all with their own systems, we're going to get a lot more data. But NASA still holds on to a lot of it. So for example, with what I presented, we need the raw data. We need timestamps. We need data in a format that we can do true academic research. So if we were just to do those two things, and again, we could use support from Congress, I think, to push that. Uh, I think NASA could play a tremendously important role, and particularly the aviation community and the commercial space community. The amount of data we get, I think, would completely shift the level of sophistication on this topic. And I think there's also um, probably about 20 or 30 hours of some of that um, forward interagency content uh, in the Space Disruptors Day and the Ecosystemic Futures podcast, which we have Diane in the room here today. So thank you, Diane, for helping get that information out broadly. I do have to say, though, I'm a little less optimistic than Anna relative to the adoption in government. As I said during my testimony, that particularly academic members of the NASA UAP independent study team were threatened, outright threatened, not for saying UAP are real, but for just having the temerity of even reviewing the topic. You can't see sides in that environment. And part of the reason that I'm calling for Congress to help is there's still a great deal of skepticism, even just at NASA, and careers that get ended just for having, again, the temerity to research for it. So I think it's incumbent of all of us to push for real science, objective science, overcome that stigma. Let's get the data because our economy and our national security may be depending on it. And I think you contributed so much. So what I would say is some of the things that you experience, you know, or that Lou, you know, and Chris and others experience, there's that body of having been able to point to those leaders. So we had the advantage of being able to point to your study, you know, into this prior work. So, um, you know, and again, I, I think there's the opportunity for the government, but I would say that it's it's not, there are industries that move forward that are not um, forwarded by the government. But I, I think just to be something very important that came out, because sometimes if we say, oh, UAP this, UAP that, um, there's going to be some great technologies that come out of that. That is very fluffy, you know, and who cares? So I think um, something that I got briefed on in an unclassified, just informal, no classification level environment, and both in, in personal capacity, but then I later brought that person in to brief others in the agency, 
is there a real and meaningful technologies that have come from these programs? And I think with a lot of this information, you're gonna see that you know, the story about it has been in the internet for decades, perhaps. So what I have, though, on, uh, from a very credible source was that, yes, there are people who say that this came out of the UAP programs when we talk about lasers and semiconductors. And that was so important. You know, semiconductors, the top 10 companies today, a $6.5 trillion industry that we all benefit from and underpins our global economy. That is something that it's not just, oh, maybe we'll get something. It's that there are tremendous people who have built things, you know, both in classified and unclassified environments. And uh, that's been, you know, put out by so many authors and people in the news. But some arts are in environments that we can say this is taken seriously. And those people have told the government that, yes, there's been real advantage on some of these most important core technologies from coming from crash retrieval. And I think to get the government to take it seriously, we need to engage the public. We've got to get outside the UAP bubble. And Dan Farah did a tremendous movie, Age of Disclosure, this really blue story in many ways, extraordinary to himself and Jay Stratton. If we can touch the public, if we can get them engaged, if we can get them the same information that we just saw, I think that would be completely transformative. Well, let me, since time is on the S, first of all, thank you sincerely for your participation. Your research fantastic conversation. Let me leave a couple thoughts here, if I may, before we say final farewell. Uh, one recommendation we made to Congress is the um, generation of a national intelligence strategy that would be promulgated on an annual basis, just like we do for other our targets. Um, it's a system that we uh, perfected, all right, and then right on the heels of that, a national strategy every year, annual strategy on UAP and drone. Basically, any unattributed objects that are our size, uh, we should have strategy for it because we're seeing uh, both on the uh, combat field and even in the streets of New York, we're, we're seeing technologies that we, we can't really explain and frankly could be used against us in a very nefarious way if we don't get a handle on it. Um, two, what I'd like to do is propose, and, and hopefully Congress at some point will be open to this, that we should go far like this every year for the American public and for the media and allow Congress to get to uh, the bottom of things and ask the questions that they normally wouldn't be able to ask and bring in the Department of Justice and the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, and bring them all here, why not? Right? Sending that to your front American people by the way I look at it, you're paying their 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 paychecks in movies, right? They kind of owe you some answers and they owe Congress some answers. Um, I would also say, please let your members of Congress know that you support this. If you like what Representative Burleson and Representative Luna and Burchette and others have done here today, let them know, right? They need to hear this. And so other members of Congress can see this and say, hey, that works, right? Tell them that. They need to hear that feedback. Unless you don't want one of these again. Um, um, but that would be my suggestion. Last, but then on these, I want to thank specifically our members of Congress, um, because at the end of the day, they're your representatives. They represent this country. They are very much part of this country. And they are the reasons why you are all here today and we're here. They have facilitated this. They have sponsored this. They have gone another way. You put their political careers potentially in jeopardy for even having this conversation for you. So um, if you appreciate this, let them know. And last but not least, thank you to every one of you. Again, our friends in the media. The folks that came over here, some cases uh, came from across the world and traveled here very long distances to be with us here today. Thank you very much. Um, it's very meaningful. And we are on here because it's been a good effort. So with that said, let's give a round of applause to our guests here. And a huge round of applause to our rep girls who have been out. Thank you to half an hour for the get us out of this room. So with no further ado, uh, this meeting is now officially adjourned.